uh, MHCC meeting. And before we start in our an, an agenda, um, we have a new commissioner on our board, and we'd just like to introduce her and also welcome her to our um, to our group. And Beth Cashin is um, an architect. Yes. And so we welcome her to uh, thank you for also serving. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, staff, and also applicants for working together. For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. And we ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. Pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County. This is start statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. I want to make sure we have any council members today. Okay. And our first um, on the agenda is adoption of the August 11 and August 17, 2022 minutes. Uh, commissioners, any questions or a motion? Madam Rule. Second. First and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed, and that motion passes. Robin, did we catch the names on that? Or would you like to? I did, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. All right, and adoption of agenda. Robin, are there any changes? Yes, we have two that have been administratively permitted, 417 and 419 Broadway, so those will be taken off consent. And 521 Woodland is requesting a deferral, and we're asking to defer the rules of order, the revision to the rules of order. Okay, any questions to Robin? Other than that, is there a motion to approve the adoption of the agenda? Move for approval. There's a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed? That motion passes. I will uh, present the consent agenda here. Uh, as a notice to the audience and the, um, in attendance, the items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held for each item, nor will the commission debate them unless a member of the audience or a member of the commission requests that an item is removed from the consent agenda. I'll read out each case one by one, and if you are in opposition to the project, please raise your hand when we call out the case that you would like to have heard. Any items removed from the consent agenda will be heard at the end of the meeting. So uh, the consent agenda as we have it here includes uh, a addition and partial demolition at 1710 Beechwood Avenue, construction of an addition at 2000 Eastland Avenue, uh, an addition with setback determination at 925. Sorry, I should slow down. Uh, <laughs> I did say I would pause after each one. So the first is 1710 Beechwood Avenue. Okay. Uh, an addition at 2000 Eastland Avenue an addition with setback at 925 Halcyon Avenue, uh, an addition with setback determination at 178 Kenner Avenue, an addition with setback determination at 1601 Lillian Street, uh, and an addition at 2007 Linden Avenue, uh, an outbuilding construction at 1101 Montrose Avenue, um, an addition at 3701 Whitland Avenue, and alterations to the facade at six, uh, 
sorry, 166 Second Avenue North. Uh, and lastly, construction of an addition at 901 Ackland Avenue. I do see a hand. Um, we can, um, yeah, we'll, we'll pull that item from consent and hear it at the end of the meeting. Sean, you perhaps want to, uh, if, if it wasn't heard before that that item will be heard at the end of the meeting, which usually is approaching 5 p.m. So just so you're aware, if you can stay that long. Just wanted to clarify. Yes, please. Uh, maybe uh, we remove from the consent agenda. Maybe uh, the person can ask staff a clarifying question and then uh, determine if it will be able to put back on the consent or not after the question. So can we hold that, uh, remove that uh, Ackland Avenue of the consent and then after uh, staff uh, discussion with the audience and the staff are discussed and we can hear but the person may not have to be here. What we've done in the past is removed it and then staff's met on the hall or something and often those questions can be answered right and then you could go ahead and if you had a satisfying answer you could go ahead and leave and then we would just cover it at the end more quickly. I think that would be appropriate. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? So, um, the person who's in the public, did you send public note? Uh, did you send your comment in? Is that? I'm afraid not. My husband just kind of gave me this thing the other day and said, hey, I think we should come to the meeting. Okay. All right. Because we received uh, one public comment. We just want to make sure that that was you or not. Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, remove that from consent. I do have a presentation prepared, but if we can sort it out, I can do a do we, the quick version or long version, legal, but it'll be at the end. Do we need to vote on that, or is it okay to... Yeah. Uh, when you when you vote on consent, you'll leave out 417, 419, and 901 Ackland. Okay. So with uh, the revised agenda that you adopted at the beginning of the meeting uh, and with the exception of 901 Ackland Avenue, which will be pulled from the consent agenda, staff recommends approval of the remaining items on the consent agenda uh, with the applicable conditions and the staff recommendations uh, finding that they each meet their uh, respective design guidelines. Okay, it's a matter of protocol. So legal, just wanna make sure since we adopted the agenda already and that's on the consent, do we need to re-vote on the consent agenda? And you can, you can adopt the recommendation to uh, take that item out of the consent agenda. Okay. Yeah. So I'm chair with the, the yeah noted yeah. withdrawals from the consent agenda and pulling the final okay. item 901 Ackland. I recommend approval with the staff's analysis and recommendation of the consent agenda. Okay. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. None opposed. We see that passing. Thank you. Um, Robin, before you dive into number 17, um, just want to acknowledge that Metro Council approved ordinance BL 2022-1382 and that has reference to tax abatements. And um, we want to just acknowledge Council Member Syracuse, who has been diligently uh, efforts on this particular ordinance to increase a limit. Um, but again, if he is listening or anyway, we just want to to be sure that we give our thanks and efforts to to that uh, goal. Thank you. Yes, he worked very diligently and very hard on this. I agree. Um, so this is the, our first round of tax abatement projects. As you may remember, this is a new program that you approved a few months ago. And it has an annual deadline, and it's for projects that are not zoned R or RS to receive a tax break on their bill for up to 10 years. Um, all three projects that have applied for this round 
they meet the basic qualifications in the design guidelines. None met the preferences, but even those are just preferences, they're not qualifications. The commission approved the preservation permit application for 627 uh, President Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan Way last month, or as you may know it as 2nd Avenue South. The Nashville Arcade did not meet the notification deadline to be reviewed this month, and the Ray Building application was approved earlier in this meeting on the consent agenda. Staff recommends the a condition that the Nashville Arcade obtain a preservation permit for their work, although what they are proposing does meet all the guidelines. Since the approval of the revised cap for applications was approved yesterday, I have a simpler version of the recommendation than what is in your report. So finding all three applications qualify, the proposed projects meet the design guidelines, and the applicants have, been, have filed for historic landmarks for those two properties that are not already designated. Staff recommends approval of the request with the condition that the James Geddes Engine Company number six and the Nashville Arcade are designated. Again, they have applied. They just need to, to finish the designation. And that the Nashville Arcade obtains a preservation permit for their planned work. Finding that with these conditions, the projects meet the requirements for the historic tax abatement program. That's great. Thank you. Um, so that's just, we don't have an applicant that actually comes before that. We are the applicant. I mean. <clears throat> no, those property owners are, are the applicants for each one of those. Okay. I don't believe any of them are here today though. I know one's out of town, or two of them are out of town owners. Okay. And one is out of town. All right. We're gonna open public hearing for that. And if no one has any comments to this um, momentous ordinance, then we will close public hearing. Commissioners? Madam Chairman, I'm so um, pleased to see this uh, tax abatement program and uh, the projects that are represented by that. I think it's a great step uh, in uh, moving ahead with uh, advocacy for historic preservation and I move for approval. Thank you, Vice Chair. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes gratefully. Next up is the actual designation of one of those three projects, and that's for the James Geddes Fire Hall. And the owner requests this, obviously, based on their application for the abatement program. This is a, a really easy one in terms of whether or not it qualifies, because it's already listed in the National Register, and so that means it does qualify. So staff suggests the commission recommend to city council that the James Geddes Engine Company number six be adopted as a historic landmark, and the existing design guidelines for historic landmarks, landmarks be used to guide future changes. Thank you, Robin. Is the applicant here? No, they are out of town. Okay, they are that's the one out of town. The company is out of town, so they couldn't make it down for the meeting. All right. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Discussion or comments or motion? I'll, I'll mirror what you just said, Cyril. It's, it's, um, I love this fire hall. It's, it's a wonderful structure, and I'm happy to see this. So I make a motion to approve the um, historic landmark designation for 627 President Ronald Reagan Way. Okay. There's a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Seeing none, and that motion passes. The first violation today is 1121 Calvin Alvin Avenue. This property is a circa 1925 bungalow home that contributes to the Lachlan Springs East End conservation, conservation overlay. So the violation at issue is the enclosure of a portion of the front porch. The photo you see on top was a doodle image from about 2019. Image on the bottom is what was discovered when the, when the violation was initially found. So. 
the permit, uh, the, the, excuse me, the property as of right now does have two open permits. One is a DADU that MHGC did approve. The other is for interior demo work. That did not include any exterior work or increase of the footprint of the home. So the addition as constructed, remove, it, remove the majority of earlier features to include siding, framing, porch, the porch floor, the porch rack, trim, and doors, and windows. Several sections of the guidelines state that the removal, covering, or altering, altering of architectural features is prohibited. And traditionally, porches, openings, and cladding, especially those on the front, are seen as character-defining features. The so staff finds that the partial demolition does not meet sections 3BA and 3A. Um, to not meet the guidelines, sorry. Um, the addition also is located on the front facade and does not meet sections 6A1 and 6B1 of the guidelines. Finally, the porch encloses a portion of the wraparound porch, covers significant architectural details, and changes the form design of the historic porch. The guidelines state that enclosing a front porch is not appropriate. So this addition does not meet sections 6A1 and 6B12-14. Staff recommends that the front addition is disapproved, that the porch's original design be reconstructed following the dimensions, design, materials of the original porch within 60 days of the commission's decision, and that the applicant submit drawings illustrating the reconstruction within 30 days of the commission's decision. Staff finds that the addition does not meet the following design guidelines, section three for demolition and section six for new constructions additions. Of part one of the Lachlan Springs each in chapter part two design guidelines and in chapter two of design lines for turn the 20th century districts. Do you have any questions? I do have a question. Um, the it looks like there are two front doors on the home. Uh, is that existing from previous as renovation far as I'm work aware, or yes. prior to the designation? Or I'm just curious. That it doesn't sure. look like a duplex is the reason why I asked. So. Yeah, I'm not sure when those were installed, but that's not part of the current violation. Then in the historic tax assessor photo at the end of the report, it shows two. I believe the homeowner is here. So would you like to speak? Come on up. Thank you, Kelly. Hello, how are you guys doing today? Good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, my name is Alexis Springer. I'm the homeowner of 1121 Calvin Avenue. Um, April, I mean, I'm sorry, um, August of last year, my home flooded due to um, sewer issue. I had a, a mainline uh, break and back up into my home. So I had to have my um, home basically gutted and reconstructed. Um, I definitely didn't want to do this. Um, it was something that was out of my control um, due to the historic um, home and things that were not up to codes and things of that nature. I had to do more extensive um, renovations than I initially expected. Um, I was not even aware that um, I needed to get an approval to do any additions or anything like, like that. I've kind of been learning as I go with this process. Um, with the addition, uh, when I purchased this home, I, I've lived in East Nashville my entire life. I was born and raised in East Nashville, and I bought this home. I moved in this home. I was actually renting, and um, I was able to, it was a blessing. I was able to purchase the home um, a few years back, um, and I am a mother of seven. So um, I, of course, now with the prices that have risen, other things that have taken place in the community, it's not as easy for me to be able to afford housing that will accommodate um, my family size. So it made more sense um, to try to expand um, the livable space that I had already in my home than to try to um, move to another location because I just couldn't afford um, afford to do that at this time. So um, when they came by and let me know about the violation, I just let them know that I, you know, of course I was apologetic. It was not intentional. I did not know that anything that I was doing um, was wrong. Um, I definitely intend to preserve um, the historic character, even with the renovations that I'm doing inside. I've kept my windows. I've kept my fireplace. I want to maintain everything as far as the character because I love the Victorian home, the Victorian field. This is my dream home. Um, so it's not my intent to do anything to take away from the character of the property or the neighborhood. Um, but 
it, with my enclosure, I just wanted to expand more livable space so we could have more room for me and my children. And the outside will look exactly the same. I'm going back with the same exact wood. The color of the home is not going to change. It's going to be repainted the same exact color. The materials that are there now will be the same type of materials that would just basically be used to close the um, side of the house in. Um, on my street, I'm the only house that has um, that wraparound to the side um, on the porch. All the other per porches on my street are straight across, just like how my porch will be, um, you know, once we finish the construction. So it will definitely blend in with the neighborhood. It wouldn't do anything to take away from, um, you know, what's pre-existing there or um, fitting in with the culture of the neighborhood. So um, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm asking or, or if my plea even matters, but um, I definitely wanted to speak on the behalf to let you all know that um, it's not my intent to do anything um, other than, you know, live here and pass this home down to my children. This is a place that I, you know, I hope to call home for the rest of my life and something I can leave to my children. So, um, yes, so I just wanted to just let you guys know that, and hopefully you all um, will take that into consideration in your decision. Um, but once again, um, nothing will be um, changed. Um, so what you see there now, once they, you know, the plan is once they finish um, wrapping the outside, they'll put the wood up. Um, it'll be painted the same exact color as the existing home. It'll be the same exact, it'll be seamless, and then the porch will go straight across. I'm not removing any doors or anything like that. Um, I actually like the two doors in the front. And I think that the home was previously a duplex, um, but it was rezoned to a single family home. Um, but that was prior to me even moving into the home. So thank you all for your time, and um, hopefully you all will understand where I'm coming from and uh, grant me mercy in this situation. Thank you. T tell us your name one more time. Um, Alexis Springer. Ms. Springer? Mm -hmm. Oh, gotcha. So do you have a contractor working with you? Um, I do. Um, so when I originally started, I went through my insurance because it was a, um, obviously it's an insurance claim because of the, the type of um, issue that I was having. And they connected me with... Um, I guess, contractors through the insurance. Well, when I originally started working on the home, it was um, during the pandemic, during the COVID era. So um, they, I had to immediately, me and my children had to be removed. So we had to go to a hotel. So we, we've actually, we haven't been in our home for over a year. So it's been a very stressful process, as you can imagine. Um, so we had to get on the waiting list with the contractors. And then they had to come in immediately demo because of the water preservation to try to uh, preserve whatever was there so it wouldn't be more damage due to the water. So they came in. They had to come out and take, in, take out all of our bathrooms, our kitchen, so we couldn't live in the space, and we had to immediately leave. Then, I mean, even now, we're still waiting, so I finally had somebody refer me to a contractor that's been trying to assist me to kind of get to the finish line with things. Um, but once again, you know, I didn't even know about a permit, I didn't, because I, once again, I'm going through the advice of my insurance company, so I had to go to them, I had to, you know, go to, the, um, to this, this group, get the um, permit for um, the constructions and all that type of stuff. So I um, went through that process and I got the permit. Well, I did not realize when I got the permit that there was another step to try to do the addition because once we gutted it, once again, if I'm spending this and I'm, I'm having to go above and beyond because there were certain things that I wasn't expecting to have to do, but due to codes, I had to bring it up to codes, electrical, plumbing, um, all those type of things. So at that point, it was like, okay, well, you know, we need more space. My children, you know, when I moved into the house, they were younger. You know, now my oldest is 16. He's six. Four, six, five. So you know we were kind of outgrowing the space. Right, Ms. Springer. So is your contractor here with you? No. Okay. So let's get this clear. So you had a, a claim, and it went through your insurance company. Mm -hmm. They did all the permitting at that time, supposedly for other whatever work that needed to be done. No, they did not do any permitting. Okay. They just hooked me. They um, connected me with a water preservation company that was supposed to come in and do the. Okay. The to dry it out. So they did the demo and everything, and I had no clue about getting a needing a permit or getting a permit at that time. I wasn't aware of that until someone um, from Coast notified me and said, you know, we received notice that you're actively working on the home. And I was like, yes. And I was like, well, you need a permit. And I was, I was like, I'm not aware of that. So then you have a, a new contractor now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Just to clarify that, commissioners, do you have any questions for Ms. Springer? I do. Um so the contractor, the, the water remediation company, mm -hmm. they're the ones that actually started this 
adding on to the porch and everything for you. They did the demo. They did the demo. They did the demo and then went MIA. <laughs> okay, and then a and separate contractor came to do to build it back for you. Well, originally the water preservation company was supposed to do the entire project. Okay. But after they did the demo and submitted their check to the insurance company and got paid for the demo, then they started, you know, well, you know, I, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, they had employees out with COVID, and I think they were going through, I think everybody was kind of going through a rough patch, and um, they kept pushing the project back on the actual reconstruction part. And so, you know, during that time, you know, that's when I kind of went back and was like, hey, you know, we need to get back in our home. Me and my children are in a hotel. You know, this is not really, you know, conducive to um, things like that. So that that company ended up kind of falling by the wayside. And then someone else I knew referred me to another contractor that kind of stepped in. Contractor. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We have another question, so we might, okay. At the moment, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments as well. So we may have other questions, but. Okay, you know. thank you. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, mm -hmm. Kelly may have already said this, but um, Ms. Bringer is the applicant for the codes permit, and the description was to conduct interior renovations. So that's why we signed off ignore and believed it to be only interior. And no change to the footprint. Well, this is enclosing a porch, so there truly isn't any change to the footprint, but the description says to conduct interior renovations. Okay. So when we see that, we don't stop someone and make them get a preservation permit because we don't review interiors. Duly noted. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Commissioners? I will start, Madam Chair. It really breaks, you know, our heart because I do understand each homeowner, especially Miss Springer's situation. But as a uh, historic zoning uh, commissioner, it is a major viol uh, viol a violation of the design guideline and especially uh, Secretary of Interior's uh, guideline. Uh, we are very cognizant of the big change in front facade. Uh, looking at the Sambo map, uh, this house has wrapped around a porch since uh, 1669. Uh, so that is, a porch itself is a historical feature. So enclosed really change the character of the house. And so I do understand the reasoning and the situation, but follow the guideline, uh, I think staff analysis is right on. Thank you, Commissioner. Madam Chair, um, I just want to Yes, our hearts go out to you. I just went through the same thing, and I had to stay out of my house for seven months, and it was a nightmare. I cannot imagine what you've gone through with six children in a hotel room. I'm so sorry. Are you back in your house yet? No. Oh, jeez. Um, un unfortunately, um, I have to agree with Commissioner Johnson that it is a defining feature, and, and hopefully the contractor is responsible for that. Excuse me. And um, and you can get some recourse from the contractor. So um, I have to agree with Commissioner Johnson. Also, my, my heart also goes out to you. Um, I live not far from you. And in addition to the, what the other commissioners have said, we see a lot of unfortunate situations like this involving homeowners and contractors where the contractor may or may not have done what they were supposed to do. But it's important for us to hold the line on what the rules say because we're constantly worried about setting precedent for other people to start filling in their porches or doing things and then coming and asking for permission to do it. And in this case, it's pretty, it's, um, I'm sorry that, uh, you know, you weren't aware of the, of the permitting situation. I know how a person can get into a situation like that. Um, but as a commission, what our charge is is to, to uphold what the staff has said in, in this situation. So, um, yeah, I, 
I think it's pretty cut and dry, unfortunately. But we're here to do, you know, this is what our, our charge is, to protect historic buildings in our neighborhoods. So. Any other comments? Um, there is some under the recommendation about timelines, and I know that, can we just look at that and give our applicant some leniency on a timeline, perhaps? Um, because it, number two says design of materials of the original features within 60 days of the commission's decision. Um, I think three seems to be reasonable, but you know, 60 days of construction under these environmental, I mean, in the environment that we're in uh, construction-wise. So some comments on that. Hey, Madam Chair, I, th I think having the coincident running clocks on this may be a little, uh, you know, a little much to ask of, of an applicant um, that first, Firstly, that the applicant would have 30 days to meet the submission of some drawing or, or something that indicates uh, putting it back to its historic, uh, documented historic condition, or at least by documented in photographs. And then the clock would tick on, on the reconstruction piece. At a minimum, would that would be my suggestion to the commission to consider. So are you saying still consider number two? As a recommendation, and no other change to the timeline. I think that uh, it says two and three, so I would guess that from our a decision, whatever that might be today, thirty days is ticking, and sixty days is ticking from today. I think the thirty days ticks. You do the drawings before you start the work. That's the way these things are supposed to go, and so you go thirty days. That submission is noted by the staff, approved, and then the 60 days starts ticking at a, at a minimum to provide the, the applicants some, you know, some, a realistic time frame, I think, to, to do this in, whether the commission feels like 60 is enough once once the drawings are submitted. I guess a, a clarification to, um, or from, from legal here is that in the recommendations of staff, there, there really are two, two items that would be a a requirement or show cause requirement of this, and if, if one was violated and then the other, you know, if, I, I don't, there needs to be some recourse no matter what we do that, that you know, the government has to, to cause this to happen. So I'm, I'm curious if both of these things, what the punitive outcomes would be if both or neither of these are met and, and whether they need to both start counting from today or not. I don't believe you can, you know, change his recommendation as you like. If you'd like to have the second um, deadline to begin counting from the date, the um, when the, that initial 30 days is at the item three, it's fine if you amend it in that way. Mm -hmm. So Ben, are you saying to just essentially flip through in three into two? So the three and, and that the 60 days starts counting after yeah. the drawing submission. Yes, I am. Okay. And that in that case, it's not an and, it's this, then, that. Right. Not an and statement. Okay. Any other comments or a motion? Yes, please. Oh. One of you. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, I'll move for um, on the violation show cause uh, for 1121 Calvin, in, Calvin Avenue, finding in fact that um, the violations as presented by staff are, are um, the correct application of the guidelines and, and that the applicant um, front edition is disapproved, that the applicant will submit drawings illustrating the reconstruction within 30 days and that um, upon submission and approval of those drawings that the applicant will have 90 days to um, replace and reconstruct the house to, to the submitted drawings. Okay. So again, that's a little adjustment to number two. Instead of 60 days, you're saying 90 days. Okay. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. So what does that mean for me? I'm sorry. Ms. Springer, I, again, we're, we really um, are um, compassionate to you. Yes, and let staff work with you. And 
one of the staff uh, will work with you. Robin, who's on this project? It's you. <laughs> okay. So, Ms. Springer, you'll work with Ms. Ziegler. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next case is 1111 Halcyon. The house at 1111 Halcyon Avenue is a circa 1905 Victorian cottage that contributes to the historic character of the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. An addition and outbuilding were permitted for the property in August of 2021. Before construction started on the outbuilding, staff met the applicant on site to discuss potential issues identified by the applicant. The ridge and wall heights meeting the guidelines relied on the ability to dig down several feet, but the applicant indicated that they were not able to dig out the site as deeply as planned due to location of the sewer. At that time, staff advised the applicant that if there were any changes to the, result, to the plans as a result of this issue, then revised plans would need to be reviewed to determine if the outbuilding still met the design guidelines. No revised plans were submitted and no inspections were called in for the outbuilding. On August 24th, 2022, staff visited the site for a progress inspection and observed that the construction on the outbuilding was largely complete. As, construction, as constructed, the outbuilding was taller than approved and the wall heights and right side setback did not meet the design guidelines as constructed. As constructed, the ridge height grew to 22 feet from top of slab and the wall height grew to over 15 feet from top of slab. Since the ridge height does not exceed 25 feet, the outbuilding can meet the design guidelines for ridge height. However, the outbuilding exceeds the maximum wall height of 12 feet. Here are the side elevations as constructed. And here are the front and alley elevations as constructed. And then these are photos of the elevation facing the rear of the house. And this is the alley and left side elevation. As constructed, the scale of the outbuilding has moved toward a full two stories, while the historic house is a true one story. In addition, the design guidelines specify a maximum wall height of 12 feet for outbuildings that are behind one and and one and one half story buildings. For these reasons, staff recommends that the wall heights of the outbuilding be reduced so as not to exceed 12 feet per the design guidelines. As constructed, the outbuilding meets all setbacks except the right side setback. Um, that's indicated there with the, the red arrow in the top. The minimum side setback for outbuilding with a footprint greater than 700 square feet is five feet. The outbuilding was permitted to be at least five feet from the right side property line, but was constructed four feet, six inches from the, from the property line. Since the proposed setback is only six inches less than permitted, staff finds that the proposed setback determination could be appropriate as long as the wall heights are reduced so that the massing of the outbuilding meets the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the project, including the setback determination, with the conditions that the wall heights not exceed 12 feet per the design guidelines, that a correction plan and timeline be submitted within 30 days, and corrections be completed within 120 days, and that all doors be approved since they have not yet been approved. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but I think also the applicant is here as well um, and would like to speak probably. Any questions to staff? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm um, Nathan French. I'm the owner of the house. Um, we worked closely with historics and when we were submitting the plans in the beginning. Um, I really wish my architect was here today so he could really speak because he's the one that did the drawings and all that, but he was unable to attend. Um, so me and my foreman are here, but... Um, working on this house has been challenging, lots of budgets, hit a lot of rock, which is what ultimately caused a lot of this not to go as deep and where this eave is off now on this height. So um, over budget, like everyone, <laughs> and I am, um, you know, asking for different leniency. Um, if there was a way I could just raise the doors, then the landing on the second level, to, make, to raise it higher, then I think we would be able to meet that 12 foot wall rather than having to rip off the roof and having to lower it that way. So I'm hoping that there, um, there's a way I could do something like that. And I've got a lot of, um, I've got pictures of the rocks. I'm way under, way smaller than any house left or right of me, way shorter. Um, 
but then I have a lot of room to um, for infill to even raise up the outside of the, uh, the the detached garage to where it would even lower that gap that uh, is uh, that we're off by on the wall height. So. Um, asking for different ways to do this other than having to rip off all the roof and do it again because that's really going to break my budget bad. Thank you. Again, your last name is? French. Like French, the language. Mr. Yes, French. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner, do you have a? Yes, Commissioner. I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused. I understand you hit the, uh, you know, foundation uh, because of the sewer, but the depth of the foundation, how relate to the uh, height of the wall. Seems like you can build on the same location with exactly as your plan submitted. Why do you have to enlarge the wall? How's the relation? That's where I wish my architect was here right now because where that transition happened, it was where we did not have to build the concrete foundation walls as deep. Those were shorter. And then that somehow got off. Um, I, I wish the architect was here. He, he, he knows it <laughs> better than I do. Um, but it, it got off. And the door, basically the landing where you come out of the garage, where I, I have a very steep slope from the front of the yard to the back. There's almost a 9 to 10 foot difference in elevation height from the front of the yard to the rear. So it was very challenging um, digging all that out and then filling it in. And we're under the main height, but it's when they did not do the foundation as deep, it somehow changed the eve of the height where it got taller because of where the foundation, um, the, the foundation wall was not as tall as it was on the drawings originally. And then the architect, I wish he was here. He could speak as to why it's off. I'm struggling with the with the math. I mean, not really, um, <laughs> but I'm struggling with the how the rock. It, it almost looks like it went in the other direction. The rock didn't cause you to pour the foundation, the slab of the garage, higher. It actually is poured lower, and that the front of the house. Where, where did you run into the rock? As you were closer to the house, or it's the entire? All the way through, or so if you're looking at my backyard, or if you're facing the front of the, the house, the entire left side of it is rock, like from front to back almost. I've got pictures of where, when we were doing the addition on the main house, we had a lot of rock there, had to dig it out, and then as you go back further and further, you can actually see the line in some of these pictures almost exactly where dirt ends and where rock begins. Um, Does the front part of the um, the garage, is it the same elevation? Is it slab on grade the same elevation as where you drive the cars into the off the alley? No. So um, that is the other problem. Had we gone even that much deeper, the because of the alley, same. I've, it's, it's, I've got two angles. I've got a front to back angle and then on the rear the of the house, slope. they got a slope. I was very worried about even going that deep because of the water that would come off the alley that would then go into the, the if you're looking at the back of the garage, what would be the right side? That one would have been way, way under the alley. Sure. So the water, I don't, I mean, the water would just went straight you into the trench drain and rock and all kinds of other issues you're working with. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it was, it, it's, um, I could see a scenario where the front would stay the same, which from the measurements taken by staff, it didn't. So that seems a conscious decision to go taller. And I think I could buy an explanation in the back with rock and some of these other things, but uh, it changed on kind of on all sides and it got less in compliance all the way around. And the, the rock doesn't quite help me reconcile that um, to be as permissive maybe as I'd like to be so you don't have to reconstruct anything. But that, I just wanted to make sure that that was my question, and you've answered it, is to understand exactly how that impacted some of the decisions during the construct, construction process. Well, thanks. So 
Was it just a misstep that if there was a change to the plans as you were permitted, that you wouldn't go back to staff and say, we needed to do this and work us through it? That is where I really wish my architect was here because there was, I believe, some communication between Mitch and Joseph, maybe a little bit about. We were called out when the hole was dug and they expressed concern about the depth of the sewer line. Um, and then we said, if this changes anything with the plans that you submitted, we need to revise plans to see that and, and please call us back out for inspections along the way if you keep moving forward. And then we weren't called back out for any more inspections until framing was up and it was at this point. Um, and so I guess they decided that at that point that they didn't need new drawings, but um, that's where we are today. Okay. I take that as a misstep. Yes, I, I believe the concern with the architect though was we were under the main height of the ridge, so we're fine there. It's the eaves that somehow that I don't, I wish he was here. Okay. Commissioners, thank you, uh, Mr. French. Is there any other questions to the applicant? Okay. At this time, thank you so much. Appreciate your presentation. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Another unfortunate situation here. Everything we do comes down to plans and what's submitted and what's approved. It was explicitly told to the applicant, come back if anything changes. That didn't happen for whatever reason. And I don't see we, that we have it really any, any option to be uh, flexible on this one, unfortunately. Again, these are always very difficult, but this is what we're here to do. So uh, that's it. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there a motion? If there's no further discussion. On uh, 1111 Halcyon Avenue, I move for approval of the staff recommendation and all conditions. There is a motion. Second. There's a second by Dr. Williams. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you. item up is 908 Meridian, which is the McGavick Harris Gatewood Web House. Uh, it was constructed in the 1840s with additions in the 1870s and 1910s. Uh, it is an individual landmark. Originally facing south, the house was renovated in the 1870s to face east to Meridian Street when the greater parcel was subdivided into smaller, smaller parcels for residential development. The historic landmark was designated in 2006. An SP was approved for the site in 2016. In addition to the historic landmark, the SP included parcels along Vaughn and Cleveland Streets, as well as additional properties on Meridian Street, including the historic church at 901 Meridian Street, which is eligible to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The application before you includes a property roughly outlined in red on the screen. Hopefully you can see that on your, <laughs> on your screen. Oh, there we go. Here's a proposed site plan. It includes the addition to the landmark as well as four detached buildings, two of which are located between the landmark and Meridian Street, and two of which are located between the landmark and Vaughn Street. We'll start with the historic building and then move on to the outbuildings. No changes to the character defining features, including changes to windows or door openings, are proposed for the historic building. The plans note that many of the exterior materials are to be repaired or, if necessary, replaced. If any material replacement is proposed, the scope of the work must be reviewed prior to work taking place, since this is a historic landmark. Other work that should be reviewed includes repointing, cleaning, and painting of masonry. The plan includes the addition of a one-story covered porch on what now appears to be the right side elevation, but was originally the rear elevation. Staff finds the addition to be appropriate as it does not include the removal, obstruction, or alteration of historic features of the building. Here is the current left elevation that was originally the front of the house. Here is the current rear. 
Sorry, but I'm getting a little bit behind here. <laughs> uh, now we'll move to the yard between the landmark and Meridian Street. The historic stone wall along Meridian Street frontage is to be, re is to be retained with the exception of two areas that will be removed to provide access to stairs and accessibility ramp. The plan proposes two new structures between the historic building and Meridian Street. New construction located in the front of the historic building typically does not meet the design guidelines, as the location would negatively impact the site by obstructing the view of the historic building. In this case, staff recognizes that the historic landmark was previously part of a larger site that had been developed over time. Structures were constructed in front of what was the original front of the building, resulting in the front facing being reoriented to Meridian Street. In addition, the historic building is set back significantly from Meridian Street. For these reasons, staff finds that the construction of two modestly scaled detached structures between the landmark and Meridian Street can be appropriate in this case. However, staff has concerns about the proximity, proximate, proximity of Building 2 to the historic building. The primary wall of this building is approximately 10 feet from the historic building, but includes three projecting metal canopies, one of which is only 6 feet from the historic building. In order to minimize the impact of the new construction of the historic landmark, staff recommends that the distance between Building 2 and the historic building be increased so that the elevation closest to the historic landmark lines up with Building 1, as is currently proposed. Building 1 is located approximately 30 feet from the historic building. Building 1 is a one-story with a height of 14 feet 8 inches to the top of the parapet, measured from grade. This building includes an uncovered roof deck that, would com that can be appropriate as long as it remains uncovered and free from appurtenances such as canopies, poles, lighting, AV um, units, uh, heaters, fans, or signage. Here are more elevations for Building 1. And here are the elevations for Building 2. It's also one-story and has a maximum height of 13 feet 4 inches as measured from grade. And here are additional, additional elevations for Building 2. The buildings located between the Landmark and Vaughn Street are identified as Buildings 5 and 6. Staff finds that the location of these buildings can be appropriate since they are located behind the historic building. Building 5 is a one-story with a maximum height of 13 feet. The current plan reduces the footprint of the building from Vaughn Street, AKA Building 6, while locating parking to the rear of the building. Building 6 is two stories with a maximum height of approximately 28 feet, four inches. Staff finds the location and massing of Building 6 to be consistent with what the commission approved in the preliminary SP. Here are more elevations for Building 6. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval with the following conditions. The distance between Building 2 and the historic building shall be increased so that the elevation closest to the historic landmark line up with the Building 1, as currently proposed. The uncovered rooftop deck... The uncovered rooftop deck building not be covered or enclosed and remain free from appurtenances such as canopies, poles, lighting, AV, heaters, fans, or signage. Three, any proposed material replacement on the historic building, i.e. roofing, windows, doors, siding, bricks, stone, etc., be reviewed before the work takes place. Repointing, cleaning, painting of masonry, if proposed, shall be reviewed before the work takes place. Five, construction fencing be used to protect the historic stone wall along Meridian Street during construction. Six, the final details of the roofing and porch floor for the addition shall be approved prior to purchase and installation. Seven, the final sec selection of windows, doors, and roof color shall be approved prior to purchase and installation. Eight, the details of fencing, exterior lighting, AV equipment, security equipment, HVAC, and other utilities be approved prior to purchase and installation. And finally, signage must be reviewed and approved prior to installation. With these conditions, staff finds that the project meets the design guidelines. Thank you, Melissa. Is the applicant here? Okay. Actually, commissioners, do you have any questions to Melissa at the moment? Okay. Applicant, please. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Patrick Napier um, with former Lucas Engineering, joined by uh, David from Pfeffer Trode Architecture, and, and our owner and client is here as well. Um, we thank the commission for their service. Uh, we do respectfully request approval with the conditions. Um, we would like to um, discuss condition one uh, with the historic zoning commission. Um, 
that building was strategically placed there based on initial feedback that we got from Metro Planning per conditions that are on the approved SP site plan. So it was a thoughtful uh, orientation and placement. We do realize that it, it is close, but we were, were attempting to meet the condition on that approved SP, which intends to preserve the open space area between Meridian and the historic home. Um, that was our only concern. Um, we're happy to field any questions, and we were, will agree to the conditions that we have, um, and we will demonstrate all of those details at permit time, which will be reviewed by Metro Historic Zoning staff uh, if and when we receive approval. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions to the applicant? Um, this may not be a question as much as it's just for the record. Um, it's, it's certainly not an accusation, but as, as this landmark is used and sort of uses happen and, you know, um, perhaps it's even sold and then a future, you know, a future user would want to maximize the, um, the space. Item two in, in particular is what I'm um, referring to. And, and while this is a landmark that's not in town and, and that real estate is less valuable, we often see violations. Um, and this is, uh, as an architect, you and an engineer, that you have no, no control over this, but I just, I guess I want to I point out that item two is, is for uh, is for good reason. I think you know if, if you want a two-story structure uh, or something with a covering, the time to apply for that is is at the application, and, and that's really all I'd have to say to, to this and other other applicants, given some of the violations that we see. Very good. Thank you. Yes. A question, question to the applicant. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Napier. Could you tell me the exact distance you are asking to, because our staff recommendation is increase a distance between building two and historical structure, and you are asking us to not to consider uh, the distance. Uh, how much distance are, you, are we talking about? Well, we would prefer that the structure remain, structure two remain in its current location shown so that we might be able to satisfy planning staff's um, request and their initial feedback. Back. Um, I would also add that um, the reason that we're proposing new structures is to retain as much of the integrity of the historic structure as we can, not having to incorporate any interior renovations more than necessary. Um, so while staff recommends that building two be shifted to the east to align with the edges of structure one across the open space, we would prefer that structure two remain in its current location as shown on the plan. I'm just curious what um, the planning recommendation was, why why the building is closer to the landmark. They wanted the buildings pushed back away from Meridian to preserve the view from Meridian in that open space. That was noted on their approved SP. But the proposed change in front of us now, because there's already buildings on the south side, you can't see it from that side. It's it's just shifting laterally. So, right. so really that, that space is going to remain the same width. And yeah. It would be a minor change, yes. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge okay. okay. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. Come up. Uh, come up. Have if you a, got something to say. David, address yeah. the commission. Oh, sure. Sure. Come on up and give us your name, please. Hi. David Bronner with Pfeffer Trade Architecture. And so the team has been working on this uh, for a while now and excited about it. But uh, one clarification I did want to make on that there is a uh, easement landscape and drainage easement to the south of there that is not directly perpendicular to the historic building. So the further the building moves towards Meridian, it will start to shift a little bit to the north, so ever so slightly. So the further it does go east, it slightly goes a little bit more in front of the building. So part of that was pushing that all the way back. See, that's good. That's there. the information that I, we were lacking. That, that's why I was jumping yeah. with my okay. hand up and down. So it's not much. It's like, you know, I don't have the calculations on me. I mean, it's just ever so slightly an angle, but as you slide it towards the mm -hmm. east, yep. it does have to push up. north ever so slightly to stay out of the landscape buffer and drainage easement. Could so. you give us an estimate? Is it two feet, one feet? I one think it, you know, plus or minus a foot. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else from your team? No? Okay. Sorry, I didn't see your hand there. Thank you. All right, um, open public hearing. Close public hearing.
you know, with respect to item one, um, I, I tend to, as planning does what planning does, and you know, we do what we do, and sometimes those, oftentimes those things are, are congruent, and in some, in this case, maybe maybe not as much. Um, but I tend to agree because we're wanting to give this historic gas that space to breathe. Um, I agree with the staff's analysis there, and, and I'm curious if. It may not be directly adjacent to um, or in line per the staff's recommendation if there's some ground or further discussion between departments and the applicant not to hold them up and have to come back and present to us. But I would be for as much breathing room that the that the historic building you know could have or more breathing room than is currently shown on the plan is my, I agree with the staff's analysis. Whether it, it can get that far and, and not being able to have um, planning's input, you know, at this meeting, that's that's sort of mine. That's my take on it. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments? Okay. Then do we have a motion? Um, not yet. I, I agree with Commissioner Mosley. I, I like the idea of moving it out. And if we're just talking plus or minus one foot in terms of this other easement that's not really shown on the plans, um, it gives the site some symmetry and I think would, with condition one, result in a, in a better outcome uh, for the site in general and for this very significant historic landmark um, in East Nashville. So uh, I am comfortable making a motion to approve the staff recommendation for 908 Meridian Street. Where's the motion? Can we get a question to staff before sure. before we mm -hmm. move on? Um, Robin, is uh, how quickly could you know a conversation happen? You think with planning, just so the applicant is not further delayed in their process? It'll depend on their schedule, but I imagine they can get back to us pretty quickly. Would um, if if we were to just allow, I think more than what's provided more than what's shown in, in the application, but some leeway to the staff. Is that something that in, in their conversations with planning and the applicant, is that something you think we, is reasonable and that you could accommodate in the next 30 days or so? Yes. Great. Thanks. Okay. Very good. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Seeing none, that passes. Robin Vice Chair had a s soft voice, but he seconded. Okay, thank you. Thank you, applicant. The next case is 201 Fall Street. 201 Fall Street is a contributing home in the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The side gable bungalow style house at 201 Fall Street was built in 1920. The house at 201 Fall Street has been neglected for a number of years, suffering from hoarding and accumulation of trash. Because of this, the home has fallen into disrepair. The applicant has provided two engineering reports. The first report from Marshall Bassett with Bassett Structural Engineering Services and Design is largely focused on the foundation of the home, describing a perimeter foundation wall that is in disrepair, a bowing brick retaining wall in the basement, and other foundation, foundation and basement level issues. The second engineering report from Anthony Locke with Engineered Solutions describes many of the same foundation and basement level issues that Mr. Bassett describes. Mr. Locke mentions the years of hoarding, which may have contributed to the to the deterioration of the floor framing. He also mentions some roof deterioration, which has led to water damage and general deterioration. Staff recently visited the home and also observed many of these issues discussed in the reports. Staff found many of these items to be issues commonly found in structures of this age. Repairs and reinforcing are often necessary, but rarely require full demolition of the structure. There is no doubt that the years of hoarding and general neglect have exacerbated many of these issues in this home. However, from both reports, it seems that the most significant structural issues exist at the foundation level. Staff suspects that the home could be supported for the necessary foundation repairs to be made, and then the necessary repairs to the framing and roof above could be made once the foundation has been stabilized. The applicant has also provided a demolition estimate, a cost of restoration estimate, estimated market value of demolition and new construction, and an estimated market value after restoration. 
in order to evaluate the estimated market value of the existing home after restoration, staff referenced the Assessor of Property website and real estate listings and was able to compile a list of recently restored comparables in this overlay, showing that the applicant could likely see a significant return after restoration, and with the rising real estate market in Nashville may even be higher than the applicant's provided estimate. This estimate also does not include the possibility of an addition, which would further increase the market value of the home. Uh, the applicant has provided uh, letters from neighbors to the property's disrepair and its contribution to the overall aesthetic of the neighborhood. Uh, the current owner has only owned the property since June 30th of 2022, and so is not responsible for the disrepair and deterioration of the home. It is incumbent on the applicant to make an informed purchase, and at least some of these issues would have been discoverable at the time of purchase. The applicant did not provide an inspection report from the time of purchase. There is no doubt that the general lack of upkeep over the years added to the to, to the deterioration of the home. However, staff finds that the home is not beyond reasonable repair. Staff recommends denial of demolition of 201 Fall Street, finding that the project does not meet section 3B2A nor 1740-420E of the zoning ordinance for economic hardship and does not meet section 3B2B as the building is contributing. I'm, I'm happy to take questions and um, the applicant I believe is here as well and would like to speak. <coughs> Anything to Joseph? Thank you, Joseph. Of Applicant? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> my name is Randall Jones. Uh, my wife, Emily, here is with me. Uh, we live at 211 Scott Avenue, which is almost uh, across the street from uh, 201 Fall Street. Uh, we've been there for 11 years. We've been in the Eastwood, uh, East Nashville neighborhood for uh, almost 15 years. Uh, I assume this thing's gonna work. So I, I wanted to walk through some of the staff's report and some of the things that we took issue with in it um, to just kind of have discussion with you all. Um, you know, when we look at the current state of the house, a lot of the, uh, the original features that made it charming uh, have long since been removed. The, the picture up there is from 1969. I've attached pictures of the recent one and several of you all uh, made it out yesterday to take a look at the house. Thank you for that time. Um, the, the side porch, which was once very charming, has been bricked over with cinder block, uh, which was too heavy for the foundation, which has caused it to crumble severely. Uh, that will likely have to be completely removed. Um, the, the front porch had uh, charming columns. Those were long removed uh, and replaced with uh, cast iron uh, columns that are not great. <laughs> um, so a lot of the things that, that we once would have looked at this house and said that those are things that uh, contribute and are charming and we want to preserve have long since been removed. Um, when we look at uh, the cost of restoration versus comparables, the, uh, the staff did mention uh, several places that these things could be removed, leading to a lower cost. Uh, I would point out that the comps that were used by the staff uh, to generate the value all are high-end renovations inside the neighborhood. Uh, so any anything we would do to remove costs from this project would actually denigrate the ability for it to be market value to the comps that were used to compare it with. Um, one of the other things that the staff points out is that uh, uh, I've highlighted here, the existing historic siding may be restored, therefore eliminating the siding material and the labor completely. Uh, we all know that that's not how home renovation projects work, right? When you start working on something, uh, costs add and compile. So at, at best, that's likely cost neutral versus uh, cost negative. Um, we, we think that Restoring, reusing, and repairing the existing structure is not a free cost and shouldn't be considered a free cost when we look at economic hardship. The other issue we take is uh, that the staff seems to be in fundamental disagreement with two registered engineers. Uh, the staff statement is that overall, despite the work needed on the home, the staff finds that the home is not beyond reasonable repair. Um, we had two structural engineers look at the home. The first was Marshall Bassett, who's a licensed engineer with the state. And he said that given the disrepair of the major structural supports, the stability of the basement ex excavation, and the overall height of the crawl space, it is unlikely the home could be safely or economically renovated. That's, that's his opinion as a licensed engineer. We had a second licensed engineer, Anthony Locke, who had a very similar uh, opinion. 
He said, it's my opinion, based on observation of this structure, that there are too many structural deficiencies to undergo proper rehabilitation. And the more efficient, economical, and safe method is to demolish and to reconstruct. Um, you know, these are not folks that uh, are likely to put their, their engineering license on the line just to say something to help us out, right? Um, but the staff seems to disagree with them and think that the home can be reasonably repaired. The last thing we wanted to take issue with was the market value. The staff pulled four comps, a very limited data set, to come up with a higher uh, sale price versus square footage. Uh, one of those was a, a statistical outlier, 1717 Benson. Its sale price versus square foot was nearly $200 higher than any of the other uh, data points that were provided. Um, the reason that is, is it had an unfinished uh, 800 square foot uh, apartment that was in the listing that once finished would add significant value to the to the home. It was a, a detached two car with an 800 square foot apartment on it. Um, if we take out the Benson and go with just the three data points that were provided uh, by the staff, we get within striking distance of each other. We're about $13,000 apart from what we think the overall value of the home is. So we think uh, we're willing to, to cede to the staff and go with a, a bit of a higher value. Um, but when we put those costs in perspective, you can see where economic hardships comes in, right? We paid $430,000 for the home. Uh, once we do foundational repairs of nearly $70,000, we remove all the waste that's in the house. Uh, and then we renovate it. Uh, we've, we've attached a bid from the contractor to do that. The cost of compliance is over $1.1 million. Even at the new higher uh, sale price per square footage that was provided uh, once we take Benson out of, out of the comp equation, uh, you're not going to get more than $500,000 out of that home. Uh, the difference there is over $600,000 in net loss to us to own this property. Uh, when you compare that to the cost of rebuild, again, 430 is a fixed cost. The bid we had for a 2,500 square foot uh, reconst new build uh, infill, once including demolition, was $666,000. Uh, just just around $1.1 million. Once you put in the foundation repairs, these are almost comparable in pricing. Uh, but because the market value would be higher, our family is only going to be in the hole about $140,000. If you look at both of these, both of these on paper are a bad idea. But we live in the neighborhood. We're committed to the community. We're committed to the people. And we're committed to making the neighborhood overall better. We think that, that a new home that has the same historical aesthetic but doesn't have the legacy of hoarding and disrepair, um, will provide a better use of the property for all, everyone. Uh, in, in summary, you know, given the opinion of two licensed engineers that the home is structurally unsound and unlikely to be safely or economically renovated, uh, given the severe financial loss that would come to us personally as a family uh, if we were to renovate the home, we think that uh, this application meets any reasonable definition of economic hardship. Uh, so I'll reserve the remainder of my time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We appreciate your meeting with us as well yesterday. Absolutely. Probably no questions at the moment. No, I, I do. Have I do. One? Um, okay. It was noted in the staff presentation that no home inspection report was submitted. Did you have the home inspected before you purchased it? We did not. No, no one was allowed to enter the home uh, during the listing. Um, the house had multiple offers inside a very short window of time, and we were able to able to purchase it given the the shape of the the market out there. Us saying, "Well, hey, hold on, we have contingencies on this contract before we purchase it," would have meant that we weren't able to purchase the home at all. Did you also, at the same time, know it was in a conservation overlay that prohibits demolition? Of, of contributing buildings? Yes, and we, we, had, we had not expected the foundation to be in as severe disrepair as possible, but it wasn't until we got into the basement, had structural engineers in there, that we were aware of how, how bad it was. Um, it, it, yes, it's, got, it's gotten continually worse as we continue to do more and more discovery. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thanks, everyone. Open public hearing. I live, I live across the street. Would you like to come and speak? 
and give us your name and address, please. Linda Podfish, 219 Scott. I live across the street from this house. I would much rather see this family build a house that's more suited to the neighborhood than another contractor with tall skinnies. Thank you. Anyone else from public? Okay, close public hearing. Discussions? I do want to make a general comment about, you know, your question about inspection. And I, I don't know if it's, you know, we've seen several um, projects where owners who are buying have, don't, have not had any inspections on the house. It could be because of the environment, the real estate, you know, if people are, you know, putting in their, their bids quickly. But it's just like buyer beware is kind of our, our uh, suggestion. Um, like even if it is, we know we know it's an overlay, but it's very interesting that that buyers are aren't as the ones we, well we have seen had have not had inspections. Commissioners that have went to see that yesterday, any comment? I have a question to the staff. Uh, on the side porch, I understand uh, the original house had side porch, but you know uh, we observed that was really altered with a cinder block. So if this house were to go renovation, uh, you know, com uh, to make it uh, the compliance, does the side porch has to stay as? As is, or would there be option to bring it back to original uh, kind of screened uh, side porch? They could certainly bring it back to the original uh, as it was historically, um, and with things like the side porch, and um, it, we found that those things, the things that have been altered, are not so far altered that it's lost its historic character. So something like the side porch could be brought back to what it was historically. Public is always here to hear us that it is difficult for us to determine demolitions um, because our purview is to preserve and it definitely is a, a process for us to, to have discernment on, on our decisions. So, I have a quick question, Madam Chair, for staff. Yes, please. Um, if you would, when? Oh, Dr. Lawrence, yes, thank you. When was this house purchased again? I believe it was late. June. I, uh, I can double check the date here real quick. I think it was it was it was recently. So June of 2022. Okay. I believe so. I've got a question to Joseph, J Mr. Rose. Um, what is? Could you give us your kind of analysis of the foundation? It seems like that's the sticking point here. So. Yeah, I, I'm going off of what we saw with engineering reports, I was only able to see it from the outside and we didn't have access down to see the foundation from below. Um, we didn't know. I mean, we could look in through a hole in the floor. I, I think um, this, the hole was there yesterday that we could kind of see, but uh, we didn't actually, weren't able to crawl around. Um, so all we were able to go off of was the engineering report with that. Um, but we have seen houses in the past with foundation issues um, that could be lifted or supported while the foundation repairs, while the foundation was completely replaced. Um, so it's something that's not out of the question of a possibility. Um, but all we have to go on is what the engineering report said. There is a, a full door and full access to the basement. Mr. Jones, yeah, we might not hear you from public hearings, so if you want... No. Yeah. Um, I, I was just going to let you know that there is a, a full access door and full access to the, the dugout basement, so it was available if the staff wanted to look at it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. I wasn't able to attend the, the walkthrough yesterday, but uh, this, from what I've read in the staff report and the engineering reports, um, we've got a pretty good track record so far in the last year, six months of, of demolition requests with almost identical uh, circumstances as this house. And we've routinely denied them unless large portions of exterior walls and roofs are open and have been open for a long time, allowing weather and other elements to get into the house. 
Um, these are, as noted rightly in um, Joseph's report, um, these are foundation problems are, you find them in almost every house of this era in East Nashville and other historic neighborhoods that have not been properly maintained over time. Um, we had one last month on Shelby that was a very similar era house type of construction, very similar circumstances. Um, I, I'm sorry that, you know, that with, the, with the market being what it is and how much the, the applicant paid for the property without knowing or having done the due diligence to, to know what, what they were getting into. But uh, our guidelines are very clear about what's, what's permissible for demolition and what's not. Um, and in this case, I, I can't support a granting a, a permit for demolition. Thank you. Um, I just got a, a comment here. Um, could possibly the applicant um, defer this so we have a chance to go in and, and have an eyeball look at that foundation ourselves. And um, and I just feel uncomfortable that we haven't haven't looked at it, you know, ourselves. And so, and I, I, I wish that the applicant, he was there yesterday, I wish you had maybe led us to that so we could see that since that seems to be the, the sticking point with this. I think that's a question for the applicant if the applicant would like to defer. I don't know if it would change anything uh, for you all or if, if, if it would. Um, I think that's up to the applicant. Uh, let's just have discussion first, Commissioner. Um, and again, I think we do try to have as much consideration for, for demolitions. And I think, um, as I read the recommendation as well, it's quite thorough. Um, even if, I don't know if we can get in under there. I mean, they have pictures and we can, we can see that um, enough from what other projects that we've seen. So if other commissioners have any comments about that, um, just let's just hold on, you know, giving a recommendation for the applicant to defer. But again, that would be their own decision and whether we would change our decision or not is on the table. I would like to uh, make a comment, uh, you know, through observation from yesterday. I mean, applicant did a great job with this presentation, uh, comparison with, uh, you know, a compliance and rebuild. And that's exactly what applicant should do. Uh, however, as I look at it, yes, I understand we do have a question about the foundation. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the estimate to address foundation is 68,000. Uh, so that will, yes, indeed, that will add to the cost. But, you know, as a historic commission, zoning commission, our job is to protect applicant investment rather uh, guide and gauge based on the condition and guideline. So with that uh, foundation work, uh, you know, personally I thought, yes, uh, foundation maybe need to be addressed to uh, renovation, but I was surprised uh, Roof seem to be relatively great shape, and I did not see clear uh, sagging or uh, you know roof laughter is beyond repair. So in that era, uh, I think the condition is pretty average with you know other historical structures. So for that reason. I think with this uh, estimate uh, addressing foundation, I think it's a reasonable cost. And also the um, uh, comparison, uh, because a rebuild is a 2,500 square foot house, where, while uh, current house is a little over 1,000. So almost double the size. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when uh, applicant do repair, oftentimes they can do addition to existing house. And it can be done since rebuilt cost is around 600,000. So I think it's reasonably add on will be about the same cost. So it seems like, you know, applicants, a point of uh, economic hardship is kind of wash because if we 
applicant go with uh, compliance with addition, it will come up with reasonable uh, return of investment. Uh, so, but uh, to me, uh, main reason uh, for uh, not accepting uh, demolition is, I think the structure itself is a reasonable uh, condition uh, average to that type. So it does not call for total demolition. Uh, instead, uh, there's uh, addressing foundation and then reasonable repair, removing um, unsightful uh, concrete block ports, it can be restored original, uh, more uh, traditional screen porch, and then they can have opportunity to add on. So for that reason, I think staff analysis is right on. So I'm inclined to support a staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. I think I think I also agree with you in looking at the structural itself um, seemed to be reasonable, didn't, didn't have um, much damage interior-wise. Um, so other than, again, the unsightliness. And we have closed public hearing. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, yeah, so I, I do appreciate your um, explanation on that as well to, to give us, you know, sort of the lay of the land of the values there. Any other comments? Well, will somebody make a motion? <laughs> Again, difficult, but... Uh, Madam Chair, with respect to 201 Fall Street, I move to accept the staff recommendation and deny demolition. There is a motion. A there is a second by Beth Cashin. And all in favor of this motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you. is 1207 Fatherland Street. The house at 1207 Fatherland Street is a contributing house in the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The house at 1207 Fatherland is a circa 1910 cross gable Victorian cottage style house. The house has been neglected for a number of years, suffering from hoarding and accumulation of trash. The house also suffered damage in the March 2020 tornado. Because of all of this, the house has fallen into extreme disrepair. The applicant has provided one engineering report. The report from Anthony Locke with Engineered Solutions explains that the existing structure is largely overgrown with vegetation and that sections of the foundation and exterior walls have been completely destroyed by the overgrowth. The report goes on to explain that the home has also suffered tornado damage in the March 2020 tornado. Uh, the structure sustained damage from high winds and wind-blown projectiles, dislodging a portion of the roof and left side wall. Little to no repairs have been made to the structure since the tornado. Therefore, the structure has continued to deteriorate. Mr. Locke also explains that the structure has suffered from hoarding and general neglect for years. The report says that the exterior walls reveal extreme compromise, including walls that have completely collapsed or are experiencing egress, tilt, and or lean from storm damage, lack of maintenance, and overgrowth. It also describes area of major decay and overloading throughout, exacerbated by extreme hoarding and roof leaks, which have led to deterioration of the wall framing, floor framing, and structural components. Mr. Locke continues or concludes by saying that significant work would be needed on all elements of the exterior structure, foundation, framing, roofing, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, flooring, support, windows, doors, cladding, etc. Staff recently visited the home and observed many of these issues discussed in the report. Staff's observations of the house agree with the analysis provided by the engineering report. Based on the engineering report and staff's, staff's observations, it seems that the roof and roof structure would need complete replacement. The foundation would likely need significant repairs, if not complete replacement, and a significant amount of the wall framing would need replacement. If all three systems are compromised, there will not be much of the historic house remaining. Therefore, staff finds that the necessary repairs would result in a non-contributing house. 
The applicant has also provided a demolition estimate, cost of restoration estimate, estimated market value of the home in its current condition, and estimated market value of the home after renovations. The current owner has only owned the property since June 28th of 2022, and so is not responsible for the disrepair and deterioration of the home. It is incumbent on the applicant to make an informed purchase, and at least some of these issues would have been discoverable at the time of purchase. The applicant did not provide an inspection report from the time of purchase. Furthermore, staff suspects that the applicant may have overpaid for the property given the condition of the house. However, in this case, no matter the conditions of the purchase, the house is not likely to be repairable given the severity of the deterioration of the home. The issue for this case isn't so much the cost of repairs, but the inability to repair. The application was presented as an economic hardship request based on the fact that the building is historic. Repair would likely not be possible for any owner at any purchase price or cost. Um, based on the engineering report and visual observation, staff finds that the scope of repairs needed would result in a near complete loss of all historic elements, which would result in a non-contributing building. Staff recommends approval of demolition based on the inability to re rehabilitate the building and the fact that all necessary repairs will result in a non-contributing house. Staff recommends approval of full demolition of the structure at 1207 Fatherland Street, finding that demolition meets section 3B2B as the necessary demolition required to repair the primary building will result in a non-contributing building, and the project meets section 3B2A as repairs are not possible in a manner that retain the historic building. I'm happy to take any questions, and I know the applicant's here as well. Seeing none right now. Thank Thanks. you, Joseph. Applicant? Hello, everybody. Uh, I've been designated for the two of us to speak. So my name is Ritesh Gupta. This is my wife, Katie Gupta. We currently live at 620 Fatherland Street, and we are the new owners of 1207 Fatherland. Uh, we want to thank uh, the members of the committee, the city commissioners, and especially um, everybody for coming out yesterday and doing such a thorough look into our case, meeting us here, as well as Joseph um, off of the historic staff and everybody on the staff who's been very, very amenable in just helping us through the process. We're This is the first home we bought together, so we're sort of going through that process, and, and I want to thank you for, for just walking us through the steps. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I think for us, we uh, agree with the staff's recommendation. Um, we, you know, we, we got a chance to see the recommendation that Joseph made, um, and we agree with it. Um, I think one note, as we got a chance to meet so many of you yesterday as we walked through, I think for us, there are so many historic elements, even micro, we would try to salvage whatever we can and, and preserve to make sure that that legacy lives on. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Gupta. Um, all right, any questions to the applicant at the moment? Okay, thank you. We might have some later, but okay. we're going to open public hearing. Thank you. Close public hearing. Any general comments? I'll make general comment then. I think here's where there's a little bit of difference, you know, not little, but difference between what we heard uh, for 201 and this. Um, because the structure, and when you look at it from the exterior and also, again, you know, walking through there, that um, the roof had, you know, it's overgrown. There was the, the, the tornado that hit that one corner and there was water damage. Um, again, when you compare the two and if public's here, that um, you know we we have two opposite um, projects that we can look at madam chair I guess I want to in contrast point out in, in this case and really all these um, hardship cases but in, in just taking taking on um, the purchase and renovation and preservation of, of historic assets. I think oftentimes in this financial, just purely an economic analysis, there's the argument of, and you see this in home inspections as well, you know, I bought a home in the 80s and or built a home in the 80s and it doesn't comply with the current codes. Well, duh, I mean, yeah, that just, it doesn't work that way. And because you purchased the home doesn't mean you're in violation of the code necessarily. And the same thing applies, I think, in while it, it can be, if you, if you put something that needs to be accessible under a crawl space that doesn't have the, the required current code clearance, you may be required to dig that out. Certainly in a historic house, you're not going to have, if you, if you pull an interior or even exterior permit, you're not going to go off and have to, you know, you'll get two by four, actual two by four measure, not nominal, actual two by fours 
that will be 24 inches on center, you're not going to have to bring that up to the current structural code. And I think that's an assumption that's made in, pre you know, in, in presentations that well, it's an all or nothing, it's an all or nothing scenario. I've got to rip all the floor out and I've got to do all of this work. It's convenient, but I don't know that it's necessarily how historic renovation is done. You know, in, in analyzing these economic hardships to go line item by line item is a, it's a laborious task, and, and I'm not sure that's exactly why we're here. I think the staff makes a distinguishing analysis in this and every case is economic hardship on its own is not necessarily the only determinant in whether a demolition would be granted or not. And I think I applaud the staff in, in this case and in all those cases for making that distinction. Did they go through the process of it, but it's not the end all be all. And certainly as a, as a commission member, I appreciate that and I agree with that assessment. Yes, thank you for further explanation as well. Yeah. Madam Chair, um, yeah, we, you are so on target as far as our visit yesterday of seeing the difference between the two structures, and I just have to uh, uh, applaud Mr. and Ms. Gupta for even wanting to attempt to, to uh, even walk in that property, uh, much less purchase it and make it a, a, a nice addition, new addition to the neighborhood. So that's, I agree with staff recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner. I also agree with the staff recommendation, but I also wanted to um, <coughs> applaud the applicant for realizing there's some beautiful pieces um, and elements on that house that really deserve another life. So thank you for that. Well said. Okay. Madam Chair, with respect to 1207 Fatherland, um, the application for demolition, I move um, approval of, of the staff recommendation for the full demolition of the structure, finding that it meets uh, the sections as cited by staff, cited and analyzed uh, by staff. Thank you. There is a motion. Second. There's a second by Dr. Williams. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you. Next one to 1212 Holly. Can you hear me okay? Am I close enough to the microphone? The historic church at this location was severely damaged in the 2020 tornado, and it was ultimately approved for demolition at the September public hearing. The proposal is to construct a new church in a simil similar configuration as the previous building. There will still be a sanctuary with rear and side wings reminiscent of the historic sanctuary with its later additions. The design and materials will also be similar, but with contemporary detailing so as not to create a false sense of history. The project meets all the design guidelines for new construction. Staff recommends approval with the conditions that all non-salvaged materials receive final approval and that the mechanicals be located either on the roof or at the rear or on the right side of the building. Finding that with these conditions, the proposed new construction meets sections four for materials, five for new construction in part one, and the Lachlan Springs East End chapter of part two of the design guidelines for turn of the 20th century districts. And the applicant is here. Thank you, Robin. Madam Chair, yes. before we get started, um, mm -hmm. I just want to disclose to the committee, uh, or to, yeah, to the commission, I previously worked on the stabilization of this project and am very familiar with it. Um, the company that I worked for was not successful in this part of the project, but I don't think that will affect my ability to rule impartially on this. Thank you. Thank you for the disclosure. Welcome back, Commissioner. Thank you. Madam Chairman, Commissioners, Welcome, Commissioner Cash. Uh, we are the architects. My name is Gary Everton with EOA Architects. And on behalf of the church, East End United Methodist Church, and our entire team, contractor, project manager, we want to say a hearty thank you to the Metro Historical Commission staff and commission that has been along with us on this journey for two and a half years now uh, since the March tornado in 2020. Uh, we are very much agreeable to the conditions that staff has recommended, uh, and we particularly want to point out that Robin has been essential in giving us guidance and wise counsel. 
So thank you for your participation. We're excited that we're finally getting to build something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Everton. Appreciate you. Yes, um, we are too. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you all went by there after the tornado, but it was um, very sad to see this historic building in the shape that it was in. And, um, you know, you do, it's, and looking at the recommendation, we'll talk about it, but thank you for the presentation as well. Okay, open public hearing. Close public hearing. Discussion? Uh, commissioners and applicants, a wonderful design. I'm excited to see it uh, finally um, come to this point. So congratulations and thank you. Uh, with respect to 1212 Holly Street, I move for approval of staff recommendation. There's a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Seeing none, we gratefully accept this. So motion passes. Member, did you want to have a comment? <laughs> You're good. Okay, thank you for being here. I think I missed you at the beginning. He just came in. Okay, next up is 2405 10th Avenue South. This existing house is non contributing, and staff has issued an administrative demolition permit. So this lot was split off from the back of the property at 1001 Carruthers Avenue in 1968. So the lot itself is very small. The house faces 10th Avenue and is the only house to do so on this block. Although a large former church across the street also faces 10th. Um, you can see up a block, there's a row of one and a half story historic houses that do face onto 10th, located across the street from Waverly Belmont School. So there's some of those historic one and a half story houses. The applicant is proposing a one and a half story house that is about 26 feet tall. Staff finds this form and height to be appropriate to the immediate historic context. The infill is proposed to be about 42 feet, six inches wide. While this is wider than most of the one and a half story houses in the vicinity, staff finds it could be appropriate here due to the unusually wide and unusually shallow lot. The house is proposed to be about 14 feet from the sidewalk along 10th. The side elevation of the house at the corner of Carruthers is about 12 to 13 feet from the sidewalk, and the side elevation of the house across the alley is about 15 to 16 feet from the sidewalk. So staff found that the 14 feet could be appropriate here. The other setbacks all meet base zoning. There is an attached garage proposed along the alley. Staff finds this could be appropriate here due to site constraints and the lack of street parking along 10th. Otherwise, the proposal meets the guidelines for materials, orientation, proportion and rhythm of openings, et cetera. Staff recommends approval of the proposed infill with the conditions that staff shall review and approve materials, the utility locations shall be reviewed and approved, and the finished floor height shall be consistent with finished floor heights of adjacent historic houses. With these conditions, staff finds the proposed infill meets the design guidelines. Um, I believe the applicant is not here. They said they agreed with the conditions and did not feel the need to attend today. So happy to answer any questions. I, I do have a question um, sure. on, and this may be a, an issue just of, of the three-dimensional program that rendered that rendered and the drawings that were submitted on on the yes. front um, three-dimensional image. There's a what appears to be like a, a proper arch shown, and then there's on one of the side elevations the brick just sort of kind of meanders across the arch and, and doesn't really, that's going to be an odd one too. And in that bottom right elevation, maybe just some resolution about, it just looks like sort of glued on brick. It, it won't work that way. So if, oh, if there'd be saying. some, some, just some clarity on, on that. So we, we know what's, uh, what's, what we're getting and what's happening being that this is a new build on that, the bottom right, the two arches there is just a little, it won't be constructed like that. I guess is what I'm saying. It shouldn't be. Correct. <laughs> Okay. okay, thank you, Jenny. Uh, since the applicant's not here, um, open public hearing. Yes, please. Hello, I am Kelsey Brown. I am the property owner of 1001 Carruthers, which is right next to um, this one, the one that 
it was removed from in 1968. Um, I just wanted to be here today to just speak about concerns regarding the historic integrity of the property and the uh, the decrease by half of the current setback between our properties um, and the addition of a second floor is going to have uh, implications for my uh, property's privacy. I know that the guidelines allow for um, a half a story, um, but that is, you know, like it, it, it's going to be looming over the my, my property um, in a way that feels very in line with kind of the, the rest of the tall skinnies that are being built around. I know that this is not at all near that, but um, the spirit of it feels uh, along that. Um, and I also just being slightly downhill uh, have questions about just the impervious land that is going to be a concern here um, and what their plans are for that. So um, that's all. But I do appreciate the how far we've gotten already, and I'm very uh, very excited about a new construction that is going to hopefully increase the value of the of the corner for everybody because I know that you guys are probably quite familiar with this with with our little corner and uh, and the big peanut butter colored house and I just want to keep it looking wonderful so thank you thank you appreciate your comment anyone else okay close public hearing Jenny, this, this is a one and one half story, correct? Or is it a full two? It's not a full two yes, story. Yes, no, the infill is one and a half. One and a half. Mm -hmm. I have a question to the staff. Uh, the comment says uh, the new proposed infill will be closer to or reduce existing setback. Uh, the, could you comment on that? I have not seen that in the puzzle map, so I just want to make it sure. Sure. So maybe it's, let's see. Um, it's probably easiest to see here. So the existing house is about, I think it was about 30 feet from the sidewalk on 10th there, and they're going to be moving it to about 14 feet which kind of splits the difference in the side elevations of the houses on either side. So we felt that that was roughly appropriate. And there is also a outbuilding going in behind the house there across the alley that was approved a while back. I noticed when I drove by today, it looks like they're actually beginning that. So um, there will be an outbuilding there as well that also sits roughly equivalent to where that house is. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Staff, I, you've done a good job on your recommendation then. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I, I understand the, the, the lady who came up, the concerns that she has, and hopefully that they will, um, they will uh, uh, be careful when they build that new house. But, you know, just... I just with I just um, agree with the staff recommendations to um, for the new instruction of the infill with the setback determination for uh, 2405 10th Avenue South. Well, there is a motion. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Seeing none. That motion passes. Thank you. Next case is 1209 Ordway Place. The home at 1209 Ordway Place was constructed in 1912. The home is a side gable brick bungalow and contributes to the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. 
The applicant requests the addition of two new windows on the side elevation of the brick home. The proposed location is forward of the midpoint of the home. The applicant intends to remove portions of the existing historic brick on the east side of the building forward of the midpoint in order to install the two new windows. Staff finds that the proposal does not meet the design guidelines because the proposed location of the new windows is forward of the midpoint of the historic house, would, requi would require removal of the historic brick forward of the midpoint, and there is no indication that windows existed in this location historically. As can be seen in this slide, no windows existed in the proposed window location on 1209 Ordway Place as far back as 1986. And that photo is on the left, um, indicating to staff that it is unlikely windows existed in this location historically. Furthermore, staff compared this home to the neighboring home at 1211 Ordway Place, which is the same style and form as 1209 Ordway Place and was built in 1912. Um, and found that it also is without windows in this location, both today and in 1986, further indicating to staff that the existing condition of this front portion of the east wall of 1209 Ordway Place was likely the original condition. Therefore, staff finds that, that the proposal does not meet sections 3B1 and 3A of the design guidelines. It should also be noted that staff received and reviewed the original proposal with horizontal windows on the left and later received a revised version with vertically oriented windows on the right. Um, this vertically, the vertically oriented windows were mailed to neighbors um, with the notice requirements. Staff finds that the issue here is to be less about the orientation of the windows and more about the location of the windows, which are forward of the midpoint on a contributing brick house. Therefore, staff finds neither one of these two versions meets the design guidelines. Staff recommends denial of the two new windows forward of the midpoint of the home at 1209 Ordway Place, finding that the project does not meet the NCZO for turn of the 20th century design guidelines. I'm happy to take any questions, and I think the applicant is here as well. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks. Applicant? Yes. Do you have my presentations, Joseph? Oh, I, I don't think I received it. Okay. I've got it. If I can pull it up or I can just speak to it. Um, I have my computer. I sent it via um, let's see. Um, and I can just speak to it too if you like me to, whichever is easiest. And if it's against protocol for me to present, I can just speak. Oh. No. I don't think so. I'm not sure. It may be easy just to speak to it. Okay. Unless you have pictures. I do have pictures, but I'll speak to it, and then if the if the pictures would enhance what I've shared. I'm not sure about plugging and unplugging. And sure. I respect that. Yeah. Um, so my name is Millie Parks, and I'm here with my husband, Matt Parks. And we um, purchased the home in 2017. It had been sitting vacant for three years, um, and we purchased it with the desire some time in our life to restore an old home. So we um, got to do just that. We spent 10 months restoring it. Um, I will say prior to even um, making a bid on the house, we met with Historic. That was step number one for us because we wanted to be able to honor and preserve the house. Um, so we did that and throughout the whole process followed um, line and step with um, Historic. We moved into the house in November of 18 and um, love our neighborhood, love our street. I'm actually a board member of the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association. So I very much believe in um, what you all do and what we were able to do this home. Um, we were on the historic tour of homes in 19, um, right before COVID. So stay tuned, we will be doing that again in a couple years. but letting COVID get through. Um, as we've lived in the home, and again, if could you all go back to our home, the picture of our home? That's the neighbors. There you go. Great. Um, so, um, so the home on the right, that's where the home is. That's how it is now. And um, if you'll notice, the porch is pretty deep, which we love. Um, we love having a big front porch. But what has happened as we've lived in it is we've realized the natural light in the front of the house is limited. And um, we're, we've been investigating and trying to figure out where we could do that. We, we can't do a skylight because we have a second floor. And really, the, the place that we think makes the most sense is to put two windows. Um, 
we came to this after, you know, thinking about options to get natural light, but also, and this is where the pictures I had taken, um, there are many homes in the neighborhood that are in keeping with our style of home that were built around the same time that do have those. Um, our plan is to do, um, there's, our, there's a um, fireplace there. You can see the top of it on the top of the house, and it's already recessed on either side of the, uh, the fireplace, almost implying that there were built-ins there at one point, or what we would have thought would have been built-ins with them windows on top um, that is fitting with a craftsman-style home. So we feel like um, while we very much honor the policy and the code and um, want to respect the home, which I think um, we plan to live in the home for a very long time, we feel like adding these two windows doesn't, um, the adverse effect of doing that is not um, d disintegrating the whole um, integrity of the home. So. Any questions to the applicant? Okay. Not at the moment. Thank okay. you. Great. Very Thank much you all. for your comments. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Discussion. I'll jump in there. I'll say why, while tasteful, the vertical orientation of the windows certainly is. Um, but I think it, it appears to match the. I can't see all tell from maybe I was referring to the other house. There's a, a window in the back, and the proportion of that would be matched. I, I think if we were asking beyond the midpoint of the house, in the past we have permitted that. Staff has, has recommended approval of, of some modification on um, historic home um, and, and conservation overlays being more permissive. But get, given that this is forward, uh, and in the front 50%, we've been consistently consistent as to not introduce conjectural elements onto um, a home, even if other other homes would, would suggest that, that it might be an appropriate place historically for that to happen. It just doesn't happen on this, this home, and then there's not evidence that it did. So I'm, I'm inclined to follow the staff's guidance there, and, and I think the Secretary of Interior standards are pretty clear on this issue. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, I agree with Commissioner Mosley, and the, the guidelines themselves are, are very clear on uh, that this is not, uh, unfortunately, for the homeowner and the applicant, not a permitted change. So um, it's a pretty, pretty clear case uh, for me. Okay. Well, with Saturn, uh, of course, you know, every homeowner would love to have natural light, totally understandable. But with heavy heart, we have to follow the guideline, especially Secretary of Interior. So for that, if no further comment, uh, with a 1209 all the way place, I accept staff recommendation of disapproval of the of windows. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. And applicant, I think you know where we were going with this, but, um, and you also, since you're on the board, <laughs> that, that your neighborhood would actually know the, the guidelines on that. But thank you for understanding that. And, and that's why we, we went through the process. Giving it a try. Before, for that reason, so I yes. appreciate you all. No, we appreciate you too. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up is 912 Boscobel Street, uh, which is a circa 1950 house that does not contribute to the historic character of the preservation overlay. MHCC issued a pre preservation permit for its demolition in August of 2022. Um, he's just going to start off with some context photos just to give you a sense of what the um, immediate context is. Um, these show the houses on either side of the site. Uh, the context is largely one and one half stories, um, although there are some historic and two story, historic and both infill two story houses in the immediate vicinity. Uh, so here you can see in the center is the uh, historic 
two-story house and then one of the infill two-story houses next door to it and across the street another infill house and then the historic houses So here is the site plan. The applicant proposes infill in an outbuilding. Both structures meet the base zoning and contextual setbacks. Here's the front facade. They are proposing a two-story um, infill, which staff finds to meet the historic context because there is that mix of both historic and um, infill two-story houses in the immediate vicinity. The house is 27 feet, nine, nine inches tall above the foundation, which meets the context. The proposed width is 33 feet wide at the street. This matches the width of the other historic house uh, that's two-story, 902 basketball, and is similar to the widths of the older other houses in the immediate vicinity. Um, there are some material um, conditions that were noted in the site plan. Um, I won't go through them now because the applicants already sent, sent me revised drawings, which reflect um, the issues that we had with the material. So they've agreed to that, and it's already been addressed. So. Um, here are the side facades. Uh, the outbuildings height, footprint, and overall scale meet the design guidelines. Um, overall, staff finds that the infills and outbuildings height, scale, orientation, proportion and rhythm of openings, roof form, setbacks and rhythm of spacing, and no materials meet the design guidelines. Uh, here are just some perspective drawings of the infill and outbuilding. Um, overall, um, the, commission, the applicants already met the, commission, the conditions that we've put forth. Um, by submitting revised drawings. So staff recommends approval with our standard conditions regarding um, the finished floor height of adjacent historic houses, uh, the review, the MHCC review on materials and appurtenances. Uh, again, the, the references up there to the materials and the labeling has, have been addressed, um, that MHCC approve all appurtenances and that we approve the HVAC location. Just general comment too. I mean, it's really great that you would really catch those details because right. we've found too sometimes there'll be some miscommunication of oh that was a white brick, but really we didn't we didn't do white brick. We really need to do brown or whatever. So yeah. thank you, staff, for for catching those little details because they do count at the at the end. Okay. Um, any questions to Melissa? Melissa, I think this is an issue on rendering. The front elevation showed all consistent windows. They, they labeled all consistent windows um, on the three, well, the, the three windows that are stacked on each other, but the right. one doesn't show two over two mullions. I, it's it's all the same label. I think it's just a rendering thing, but a, a, a window with no, it looks like it's like a full picture window. Which so not a double hung, right, yes. Yeah. And I, that will again, be, you know, we usually approve the window packages or we're supposed to approve the window packages before they purchase the windows. And um, yes, we would want to see a double hung here. It's so. probably just a function of rendering, but certainly the drawings that are that are submitted are the drawings that, uh, you know. Yeah, and, and when so. doing inspections and we kind of consider, you know, the record to be the elevation drawings because those are what, the measure, what we can measure off of and, and look to for details. Noted. Yep. Great. Thank you for that. Is the applicant here? When, would you like to speak? Yes. Hello, uh, Eli Ruth, Eclipse Construction Group, representative of the uh, uh, property owner. Um, just really, I mean, obviously we're going to, um, uh, the recommend, most recent recommendations that they gave us, we've already adapted those into the plans. Um, we'll make sure to submit uh, any additional uh, requirements from the Historical Commission on windows, anything of that nature. We'll make sure we submit all that. Um, I have done this one other time through another company, so I'm familiar with the process, so we'll make sure we abide by those rules put in place and any of the recommendations. Other than that, just wanted to thank Melissa for all her hard work and walking us through this process because this was our first new construction in historical. So um, other than that, um, we're just ready to get it going. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Applegan. We appreciate that. I always like to hear that you're working with staff very well and that you will come back if there's any changes. We appreciate that. Okay, open public hearing. In closed public hearing? Is there a motion and a discussion? Pretty straightforward. Madam Chair, I move for approval of 912 Basketball Street with all staff recommendations. Thank you. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you again.
Okay, next is 1109 Porter Road. The house located at 1109 Porter Road, it's on the right in the top photo there, was constructed in 1988 and does not contribute to the historic character of the Eastwood overlay. An application to demolish the house and to construct infill in an outbuilding was reviewed by the commission at the July 2021 meeting. The commission did approve the demolition for the non-contributing house, but disapproved the new construction at that time, finding the two-story form of the infill to be inappropriate for the historic context of this block of Porter Road, which has predominantly one and a half story houses. The current application is for a one and a half story infill. As proposed, the infill is oriented toward Porter Road. Both the infill and outbuilding meet all setbacks. The infill is one and a half stories, the height and scale that are appropriate for the historic context. This is the front and the rear. And here are the side elevations. The outbuilding is one story and meets all the guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends approval with conditions as set forth in the staff recommendation. Um, you did also receive some public comment. Just wanted to remind you of that. Um, I think, is the applicant here? The applicant is here. Um, do you have questions for me first? I do. It might be a slight one. I'll try. Again, we're really picking through plans, I guess. I had my eye on plans this time. <laughs> okay. um, just to clarify, page 16, um, and this is the, the driveway, you know, because I know we don't really approve, you know, driveways right in front, but do driveways on the side. Um, it has a graveled area in the front of the house. Is that just a miss? Because on page 17, it's just to the the driveway to the right of the buildings. I may ask the applicant to speak to that. I am actually filling in for oh, Melissa Sajid. Okay. I didn't write this report. Yeah. So I'm I think not super familiar with the project. The right. applicant can probably answer that question right. better better than I. Again, just because we, you know, parking sure. not in front of them. Absolutely. Building. Okay. Um, thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Hey there, Commission. I'm Brent Hunter, architect at Archinerd, and I'm uh, representing the owners. Uh, and thank you, Jenny. Um, the driveway question, we're using the existing curb cut and extending the driveway alongside the house. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's a gravel parking in front of the, in the front yard, uh, and we're getting rid of that. Okay, very good. Just wanted to clarify that as well, because it was on the plans. Yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, the side itself is pretty large, and I'll just continue on into the applicant fortune. <laughs> uh, the site itself is pretty large uh, and as we were here last year we realized we we're very limited on the footprint that we're allowed um, with seven more than 70 feet wide and a 34 foot wide house uh, kind of maxing out the form or, or playing with the form has been our design challenge. Uh, so thank you guys for all the time two meetings last year uh, and Jenny for all the feedback throughout as we've been resubmitting to try to tweak it and get it to within the uh, within the guidelines. Uh, that's really all we have. Uh, the only thing that we've received from the uh, neighbors or the general public is in regards to the alley, uh, it's pretty tight and it's used commercially a lot. So one of the neighbors has asked that we uh, uh, step the uh, rear accessory structure in from the alley uh, more than what would be allowed five foot. We've shown it as 10 foot um, and we would be willing to work with them or look at that or look at that with the staff too and just see if we should go beyond 10 foot so as to give that alley. It, it is a weird turn in the alley right there and it's a kind of an awkward turnaround for a lot of people. Uh, mm -hmm. So we don't want the people that are living there to be adversely affected. Uh, and then we had another neighbor reach out about the a big oak tree along the property line. Um, so we just wanted to acknowledge that we would be more than happy to uh, get in touch with an arborist and figure out root, root situation before excavation of uh, foundations on that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. All right, open public hearing, close public hearing. Madam Chair, I wanted you to maybe add a little more clarity or direction to your sure. parking in the front, okay. uh, which, is, yes. is, which we Go discouraged and, and have, um, I guess, prohibited in the past. Uh, the applicant's showing a gravel drive there and existing curb cut, uh, don't take exception with that, but I think uh, we're not showing a dimension on the width of the gravel drive, but so it's clear to the applicant. Um, they don't want to park in front of the house. That's that's sort of, the, that's discouraged. And, and I think uh, given that that appurtenances are under our purview, we just would encourage to have the width of the gravel be in keeping with the application and the site plan. There's no, no further comment than that. Very good. Good to clarify. 
I would like to thank uh, applicant for working with the staff because this, uh, the original plan was really proportionally large for that even larger lot. So this new plan is much appropriate size and you know detail. And I really appreciate the willingness to work with the neighbor, especially early improvement. So if uh, this plan currently uh, set for 10 foot, but if we can you know accommodate a better transition and more safer alleyway to work with staff and neighbor, that will be added bonus. I really appreciate that uh, thoughtfulness. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Anything else? Motion? Yeah, Madam Chair, with respect to, sorry, with respect to 1109 Porter Road, I move approval um, with the staff recommendations in uh, all conditions. Motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you, applicant, for waiting till almost the end. Appreciate your time. Case is 1110 Lillian Street. The house at 1110 Lillian Street dates to 1983 and is a non contributing house in the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The applicant proposes demolition of the non contributing house and construction of a one and one half story infill. The block of Lillian Street has very little historic context. Many non-contributing houses have been demolished in the past decade, so the block is a mix of older non-contributing houses and newer infill. Infill on this block has been limited to one and one half stories. Some of the context um, on this block can be seen on this slide. Um, on the top there, you have the existing house in the middle with some non-contributing houses on either side. The next one down is non-contributing houses across the street, and then the bottom two are non-contributing infill and older non-contributing houses um, just down the street. Um, the proposed infill is 30 feet wide at the street, matching the surrounding context on similarly sized lots and meets all of the setbacks. The proposed infill has a one and one half story form and has a ridge height of 29 feet from highest point of existing grade, which matches the surrounding context. Staff finds the proposed infill's foundation height, eave height, porch height, et cetera, compatible with the context. Staff finds that the proposed infill meets the design guidelines for materials, form, roof form, dormers, orientation, siding and building types, setbacks, parking and vehicular storage, and proportion and rhythm of openings. Um, staff recommends approval of the project with the following conditions. I won't read them all. Uh, the top three are just the standard conditions. The fourth one is the only one um, that's a little different. That's just uh, the staff or the MHCC approve um, the final material selection for the front facing dormer. Uh, it just wasn't noted on the plans as to what that would be. So we want to see that before um, uh, signing off. Thank you, Thanks. Joseph. Any questions? Okay, applicant. Commission again. Brent with Archinerd. Brent Hunter. Uh, thanks again, Joseph, for, for the presentation and the uh, leading me in. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, we're trying to blend into the context. There's quite a bit of fall and grade to the rear, uh, so we proposed a walkout and kind of a pool there. Um, but beyond that, um, we're just trying to kind of stick in line and used a very basic craftsman style house with cross forms, cross cables to really uh, pull off most of the, the space on the inside. Thank you. Thank Quick you. Question Oops. for uh, uh, I saw just something that came to mind here in the section. Your it was retaining wall to you know to create front yard backyard sort of scenario. Can we scroll back just to the? So I'm, I imagine there'll be some sort of guardrail there, and we're pushing sort of a maybe help helping the process along about we're pushing towards the front half of the house and so it would be likely something we would review to have a, a fence there or that the staff would review you may want to do a border fence or something just for guardrails so the kid taking a spill off of that you know the, all those types yeah, of things sure. just some some indication of what that fence might look like and what its height is might be something else the staff would want to look at okay definitely. does that make sense yeah yeah thanks okay. a lot okay. thanks thank you Okay, open public hearing, close public hearing. Commissioners? 
It's great to have a modest infill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, with that, I move for approval of 1110 Lillian Street. There's a motion. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, hearing none, that motion passes. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time to wait to the very end. Okay. Um, staff, Robin, anything else? No, no one Oh, yes, that's right. Sorry. We pulled that, right? Yeah. Okay. Did we I get will, it straightened um, out? <laughs> I'll keep it brief, but uh, I will do a presentation since the applicant stuck around. <laughs> I think you said you drove three hours to get here, so oh, make it worth your please. while. Please, we will hear it then. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your time. It's a good thing you did because it was pulled from consent. Uh, and this is an application to go, uh, to rehab an existing non-contributing church building and to enlarge it with a side addition. Uh, I will be pretty brief in this. I won't go into much detail unless you have questions, but... Uh, so it's a, a large lot with the church on it. Currently, it was built in 1978. Um, that green is the existing footprint. Um, and then the yellow added to that to the side is the footprint of the addition. Um, so the existing... Uh, I guess I put that in there too. Existing f building will largely remain. The front will uh, have windows and doors replaced, but will keep the same configuration. And then to the right side will be a one-story, in addition with a one-story component and a two-story component. Uh, the one-story component sits a little forward of the, the existing front facade, and the two-story component is, is stepped back. Uh, and the one story will serve as a, a vestibule or narthex and run the, the length of the building. Uh, and the, the right side of the building essentially remains as well and just is encapsulated by, uh, by the addition. Uh, as you can see, the addition as shown there uh, uh, is about two feet shorter than the the ridge height of the existing church, uh, and staff finds that the scale is uh, is appropriate. Uh, it is uh, obviously the neighborhood is residential, but this is an institutional building, so it's looked at uh, through a very different lens than than infill or a, a typical addition would be. Um, the, uh, you can see there that there's a, um, a blank uh, section of wall on the front right corner of the building uh, that uh, is slightly recessed uh, from the, the primary front brick wall. Uh, the renderings that we received, or this one rendering, uh, shows a perforated brick or a breeze block wall in front of that. Um, it was not shown on the elevation, so staff finds that that feature would be appropriate, or the, the project would be appropriate with or without the breeze uh, breeze block wall. Uh, but if it is to be constructed, we would just ask that uh, elevations for that, drawings for that be provided. Over on the right side, uh, again, it's a two-story uh, building, so there are two rows of windows and doors. Staff found that the rhythm and proportion of windows and doors was appropriate, uh, although there is another blank wall panel there. Um, but that that section of wall is researched uh, a bit from the, the primary wall, so staff finds that that helps break up uh, the perceived massing a bit uh, sufficiently. Uh, over, uh, that's the rear. Um, uh, the left side, the existing window pattern is changing significantly. Uh, the upper story windows and a door are being filled in, and then the first story windows are changing uh, significantly. Uh, but again, this is a non-contributing building, and it's an institutional form, uh, and staff finds that the resulting window pattern is appropriate uh, for, for building in uh, for this particular building, uh, for those reasons, non-contributing and institutional. Uh, and uh, 
staff recommends approval of the proposed addition and rehab to the non-contributing building at 901 Acklin Avenue with the condition, following conditions, that brick and cast stone selections are approved prior to purchase, the window and door selections are approved prior to purchase and installation, uh, walkway and paving materials are approved, and the plans for that breeze block uh, perforated brick wall would be provided before construction. And with those conditions, staff finds that this meets the applicable um, design guidelines. Thank you, Sean. Madam Chair? Yes. I have a question with yes, Sean. For sure. uh, could you summarize uh, the public comment and if the yes. question was adequately addressed? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, oops, <laughs> the, uh, the, the person who was here at the beginning of the meeting, um, she lives immediately adjacent to the uh, to the west of the property, her main co her concern, the only concern that she uh, discussed with us in the hallway was about parking, uh, which is not really the purview of the Historic Zoning Commission. Uh, this uh, the the property is zoned residential, but churches are permitted as an exception, uh, and but it will still need to go for BZA approval, and they uh, would comment on uh, they that would be the proper venue to discuss parking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Applicant, we thank you for waiting. My name is Mike O'Kelly. I'm with O'Kelly Architecture, 17 Mount Laurel Avenue in Birmingham. Um, yeah, he pretty much did a good job of summarizing it. We're taking a building that's been pretty much unused for the last 12 or so months. Um, and even before then, it started kind of getting in disrepair. So we're gonna take it. Brentwood Baptist has a one of their campuses called At Church at Avenue South. They're currently meeting in the old Roy Acoff recording studios. They've got a breeze block front on that building. So the breeze block we kind of put on the corner was not just, you know, we needed something to kind of dress that corner up. We got some restrooms there, so we couldn't really have windows. Um, we we're playing with recessed brick, and we thought, well, this would be a good opportunity to, you know, if a budget allows, introduce a breeze block. So that's why it was on the rendering, but not on the elevations. We we're trying to get budget pricing to see if we can do it. But otherwise, we're just trying to take a building that's sitting there vacant. Um, the parking question was really about capacity and layout of parking. We're actually downsizing the sanctuary. We're getting rid of some upper balconies. So that had probably... 12 rows of pews total that run down the side we're getting rid of and we're bringing the stage forward so we could put a couple adult classrooms behind the stage. The addition is strictly uh, 3,000 square feet of it is what we call common space, so like lobby space, you know, place to hang out in between services. And then the two story is gonna be preschool classrooms on the bottom and children, middle school age classrooms above. So it's really not even increasing occupant use you know occupant load it's actually decreasing it from what's there now it's just giving them more opportunities to have classroom space and gathering space but otherwise yeah it's um i'm happy to answer any questions yes ma'am uh thank you applicant uh the question is uh, there was public comment each is which is outside of our purview but there was a comment so i would like to address mm -hmm. uh, that was lighting and I don't think your intention is light 24-7 and no. not shining on the neighbors. That's right. And there's a way to kind of reduce the direction of the light. But if you would comment on that, I appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we haven't finalized the site lighting layout yet. Um, right now, it looks like some poles that were maybe provided by the power company. Um, it's got overhead. Uh, there's kind of one... <sighs> Really, if you go back up where you just had it in yellow, uh, kind of existing, there's right to the edge of that yellow um, addition, there's a pole in the parking lot, just overhead power running to it. It's pretty unsightly. There's a couple more on the east side. There's even one, I believe, to the north of the building that's just doesn't look good at all. So we're, we are trying to figure out if we're going to go back through, yeah, like th there it is right there on the north side. So we are trying to figure out if we're going to continue talking to the power company about providing site lighting or just go ahead and design something ourselves. But yeah, and, and, the, and the lady that I spoke to, the neighbor to the west, that was one of her other comments is, hey, there's a big light pole in the parking lot right by my house. Can we make sure it's not at least shining in my direction? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions to the applicant? 
Commissioner, were you satisfied to have your the public comments there? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Motion. Let's see. I've forgotten the address on this one here. Nine oh one. Yeah. Madam Chair was correct. Ackland. Yeah, 901 Ackland. Um, I move um, approval, haven't taken into account any previous public comment, and that would be addressed in, uh, in another another purview or un under the auspices of someone other than us uh, yes, that uh, the project is meeting with the uh, Waverly Belmont um, Neighborhood Concerns, Conservation Zoning Overlay and recommend approval with all staff recommendations. Thank you. There's a motion. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you very much for your trip. Appreciate it. All right, anything else, Robin? Yes, I did want to announce that we have wrapped up a violation that's been going on for years. So I was very excited about that. Uh, 111 4th Avenue South. Um, that's finally taken care of. So I wanted to let you know. Yeah. It uh, used to be swinging door, but now it's losers. <laughs> And, <laughs> and um, don't forget that next month we'll be meeting at our alternate location with the um, on Berry Road. Ransford, the school board building. Is that the one? Okay. All right. Commissioners, thank you. Appreciate your time. Staff as well. And we are adjourned. Oh, okay. All right. has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.